Hello! So I'm doing a uh, recorded video because the stream just didn't work. Um, <laughs> I have no idea what's going on with it, uh, but I had this big uh, sort of download, I guess, and, and wanted to get it out, and um, it's uh, hopefully more interesting, I guess, than some of the, the, you know, we can get, I think, into the depths of our troubles a lot when we're doing our spiritual journey, and I think that this is an interesting uh, way to consider uh, our own healing and also our own practical applications in our life as we sort of develop and move into higher vibrational spaces we start to see more of the soul's yearnings <clears throat> and part of what I want to try to hope to uh, offer some perspective on is where the soul's trying to usually take us when we're like waking up really um and so we're going to talk a little bit about the tale of sort of our soul, which is uh, the daughter of, um, you know, the All Father and the, the Divine Mother or the, you know, father and mother. Um, the child to the Divine Mother is the soul. Um, the soul is um, feminine, pure feminine, right? And so as this soul is born, it's born into a frequency that draws it towards its vibrational resonant place. So wherever it resonates with, um, it then essentially uh, bites the fruit of knowledge. It bites into that experience. This is when it becomes karmically involved in what it's doing. <clears throat> so there are, of course, souls that uh, were not brand new souls that came in. But there are souls that are brand new that came in that way um, and then have done many lives now. Um, at this stage, we're not having um, new souls really be born because we're at what's called harvest, which means that the uh, priority is given to souls that are ready to awaken, basically, uh, or souls that are nearest to that um, if they're sort of being birthed. And um, based on the planetary calling, other volunteers come in depending on what's needed. Um, but this soul uh, shows up here and bites the, the fruit of knowledge or the, the bites from the apple or bites from the pomegranate and personify um, uh, in her tale. Um, or Sophia getting trapped, right? Um, and basically, we bite in, the soul bites into the fruit of experience. Uh, which is uh, knowledge, essentially. Knowledge is gained through experience. And then it feeds Sophia, or our soul, uh, wisdom, essentially. Um, it's how we develop our experience, is through the biting of this apple. So that's how we actually become beings. It's told as a tale of uh, you know, falling from grace purposefully for, for that reason. Uh, because we fall from the perfect innocence of just pure love and then fall into uh, confusion, a confused state and forget, forgetfulness. And then we work th through a remembering and come back into our um, true, true nature, uh, which are, you know, so in our, in our day to day, we can end up having this perspective on, on this that, that really helps us to navigate what we're doing. Essentially, when we bite into knowledge, into the fruit of experience in the material world, and we uh, get too wrapped up in it, that's when we will suffer. Because that's when we're essentially into all the karma. So there isn't anything wrong with that, of course. Um, it's just the soul's going to more and more make that um, less and less comfortable because it's trying to guide, steer the ship, so to speak. Um, it's, it's trying to say, you know, it's time for us to do the things that we more planned on doing, <laughs> usually, or be the way we're more, um, it's actually not really about doing, it's more about being the way we are more called to be authentically would be a better way to say it. It's not really about doing things. Uh, although those things that end up getting done that are of the 
the unique person, the unique soul's personality, we could call it. Um, so those things end up manifesting. But that, when we're biting into the fruit, it, me it means we've become confused. We've thought that in the material world is the thing we're seeking, when the thing that we're seeking is to return home, uh, which is just to bring heaven in, in the kingdom of heaven is within, right? That's what we're trying to do. Uh, seek first the kingdom. That's what that means. Um, don't invest in the illusion. Seek first the kingdom. And then everything falls into place around you. Um, and it doesn't necessarily look the way you would think, <laughs> right? Um, but it starts to fall into place. And then also keep in mind that, you know, as the soul awakens, it takes time for manifestations to start to really come into the physical to reflect the changes in the vibration as well. Um, but yeah, so the, the uh, personify, um, perse persa Persephone, Persephone, yeah. Sorry, Persephone means to emerge, um, right? And that's what the soul does, right? The soul is emerging into itself. Uh, through investment in the illusion. Um, it's interesting that most of the tales are told as sort of like imprisonments and things like that, because that's how it, that's how it feels um, at a certain space. When, when, right, before, right before the awakening kind of starts, we start to just feel usually imprisoned. Um, or, or we feel imprisoned during our awakening. After, when the awakening is more finished, not finished, it's not finished isn't the right word, but it gets to a certain place where that imprisonment is seen as a dream. Um, so it, it's more of a, an understanding that the feeling of imprisonment was basically a concept that we were holding ourselves in. Uh, and then we release ourselves from that imprisonment. Um, it's really important to remember that the soul in its pure innocence, like it's kind of like it runs up to the, it, it doesn't run up, but it floats in towards the earth. Right. And it's just like, Ooh, Ooh, what is that? It doesn't have a voice in it yet that understands any type of fear. It doesn't have any thought of any fear at all. It's just like the, the, the soul will go to where it's called. Like it will go there and it will eat of the tree. Essentially, it will do it because the Logos births it. It has a drive to go do that thing. And it doesn't even know what it is or what it's doing. It's just suddenly, oh, I'm like separate, sort of. <laughs> Whoa! And just going straight down to wherever it's going. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, I was shown this, that, that it's sort of like, it just can't help but consume the tree. It just can't help it. Um, so it, it, it essentially all beings do this. And then they can have their awakening very quickly. Like they can even have it as an infant or a child even probably. Um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised. But this soul itself either does that from, the, from, from that location that way as a brand new soul or comes in as a soul that's been recycled, but it's the same process, basically, the same process. The karmic pull to go do the thing that it's programmed itself to do, essentially programmed, not quite the right word, but it's templated itself to do or be a certain type of way. It, it, it's just drawn into to that experience. And then in reincarnative, it's the same thing. Um, but now there's a whole bunch of story and karma that's layered up and so the soul is going to make contracts and go handle all of that uh, in however many lifetimes um so karma itself then eventually we as the soul steps out of all that karma sort of essentially realizes the illusion realizes that the story itself is like just a story that the the reality even that we're doing it in is sort of a um you know, it's a, a living metaphor or a living symbol of things. Like there, the ground is a sim. The, the Earth's ground is a symbol of groundedness and symbol of things. It's everything's very deep that way. 
infinitely so, but it's not distinctly like real. Um, though each being is clearly also a soul doing this as well. So it's kind of funky, but, but that, that perspective helps us to understand that the, the karma itself isn't really, it doesn't have a influence on what we are in truth. And, and so we operate from a, an understanding that the stuff that's arising is okay. Like it's okay. Um, a lot of it is sort of waves of the past coming back at us. Uh, and it, it's, it, we, if we are taking on a lot of karmic healing that we might do, uh, this essentially makes us the perfect little conduits or crystals for healing this karma on the planet, which uh, essentially we learn to sit in the waves of all the emotion, not the emotion, but the, the catastrophe that might be arising in the life and still be in peace because we're transmuting what seems to be affronting and we're quickly healing it and raising it, exalting it as God's will or how, how we tend to do that is, is I recommend faith, basically trusting in the grace of God. Um, you know, a lot of times we feel that we have to do so much, but sometimes we're meant to just ride something out a bit. And so of course, there's a, a balancing act there. You know, none of these statements are meant to be um, decisive in that way. But uh, the soul itself has this yearning of sorts. And the yearning is to go home. But interestingly, the way that everything is designed is that sort of by doing what it most feels called to do, that ends up being the route home. So it's by doing the thing that the heart most calls for and is yearning for, uh, or by per being the way that, that's a better way to say it, being the way the heart is most yearning to be, is that's the, the way to find home. Because when we're in that heart space, heart-centered space, we're not actually in an emotionality, we're in more of a pure love state which is where we begin to learn what God is more, where we begin to understand God, be able to hear God even from these spaces. And then the more we pull out of that and, and go into other things, bite of the tree, bite of the tree of knowledge or the fruit of the tree of knowledge, I should say. This is another thing about the, you shall know them by their fruits, by the fruits they offer. Um, it just means that biting into the, the tree of knowledge will cause us to suffer. Uh, and it's not about doing the things. Obviously, we engage in our environments and with people. It's about our emotional investment in outcomes and, uh, you know, opinions of people. Uh, these different things, how invested are we in these things? Is the more, the more invested we are in them, the more energetically drained it's going to feel um the more uncomfortable it might feel uh the more we suffer basically the more attached we are to the outcomes of things or to the being or the more we might suffer a bit um but there are certainly beings that we feel super attached to as well and even after the non-attachment of things starts to really kick in, even with family. Um, it's sort of, uh, it, it doesn't feel very different to me. Um, I'm still very, very much attached to my children. I'm just attached, I think, in a healthier way. Uh, because there's clearly still a distinction for me from my child to you know, a person in the street that I haven't seen before. Um, but there isn't that much of a difference, honestly. Um, <laughs> not that much of a difference. I'm just not attached at all because I don't know the person, what they're up to or anything, right? But I still sort of see them the same most of the time. Not all the time, of course, but I try to, I try to actively do that. Um, and that, I recommend that, that approach because it helps us 
actually healing up all this karma uh, that we might be having. Different opinions. Instead of having opinions about everyone, we're starting to just be like, I, lo I love them all, all these people. <laughs> right? Even if some of them are mean. <laughs> right? So, and, and it's, it can be challenging. So, you know, d go, go at your pace. But um, it's really interesting that uh, Persephone as well is the daughter of uh, Zeus and between Zeus and the wife of uh, uh, Dem Demeter. Uh, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, but these, she's the wife of Hades. Um, and so it's just really interesting that like, Hades could represent Malkuth or or the red energy center down in there, and so it's like the the divine uh, or the god um, Zeus right up here with the god uh, in Hades, the goddess or the wife of Hades, merging to create the whole frame. Right, is sort of what I see in that. Um, this merging of heaven and and earth essentially. Um, the kingdom, uh, Malkuth, merging with the heavens to create a, a god. Um, but the god that is created doesn't know it's a god, really. It doesn't really believe it. Um, and the people around don't believe it. And, um, and it's this really interesting sort of dynamic that plays out as they awaken to their I am presence and understand sort of that even everyone, everyone's already wide awake. They're, they're all wide awake. Um, at least uh, the awareness is wide awake of what's going on. The awareness itself is absolutely wide awake. Uh, so w it stops really mattering um, because there's sort of an awareness above the level of the soul that's just that that isn't wrapped up in any of this stuff. <laughs> that's sort of um, that's sort of where the God presence sits. The I am presence really sits up there, where uh, it's sort of like, isn't it interesting that these souls are doing all these things, um, and and just observing in that way? Like, look at how mysterious and amazing this all is. Wow, look at these children go. Wow. The, the uh, creator more sees the soul than anything, right? So the creator, um, you know, as far as what the human level aspect is doing, the creator's not really, that's like illusion. The crea but the, the soul itself is, is real. Still, still an illusion in a way, but is more real. It's pure love. So it, uh, it's more what the creator observes in you when the creator is looking at you. So that's why it doesn't really see, doesn't really see nastiness of things. It just sees the beautiful soul it made doing beautiful things. Whatever the soul is doing, it already knows is beautiful with, without even observing it. So it, um, not that it would have to observe it, like it's the observer of all observers, right? It's already observing all of it. So, um, and that's why we can't even really usually fathom too much. We try to anthropomorphize God, and even I'm, I'm doing it sort of here, trying to frame it in a human context of like how it's seeing. But it's really not fathomable, fathomable <laughs> from a human perspective. Um, and that's why we use allegory, and like I said, it's a living metaphor, a living symbol, the, the re reality itself. Um, that's why all of these stories, um, you know, are all sort of telling us the same things in different ways and with different entities, you know, um, and they all sort of tie into each other in different ways and they give each other little humble nods throughout the text. There's these links that you'll see. You, see, you can see that the prophets were writing these, the prophets and the writers of the time were writing these to nod back to where the works are um, getting the narrative like getting the um, the allegorical or or you know m metaphoric explanations of the metaphysics because these are typically metaphysicians of some kind writing these scriptures and these 
um, god myths, mythos, and things, they're typically the seers and the sages. And that's why they all align, because they're all seeing the same stuff. They're just putting their own spins on it, like spins of their culture and spins of their things. And um, they're telling the tale of what happened in the past as best they can. And then we see it all manifest here. Um, and so even, you know, for example, the, the, the entire sort of thing that the soul is doing is learning how to have ho what, what's actu the actual holy matrimony of the soul with the body uh, and the spirit to, to have this, uh, to create the, the child of God that knows itself properly um, uh, through the Holy Trinity. And so, you know, essentially the sun becomes, the solar body activates through the harmonization with the soul. Soul, solar, right? Um, the solar body activates as the soul starts to be more in harmony with itself. And so lots of people talk about upgrades and activations and things, and that's where this actually comes from. And people have a lot of manifest experience in consciousness to explain them. And I'm not saying that those things aren't true, but I'm saying that the, the light is within you, and you activate it at the soul level. And other entities certainly can um, pop in and do that as well. There is capacity for that. So, you know, I don't discount any odd tales. But generally speaking, to regular people going about their regular day, not these unique circumstances uh, with spirits or extraterrestrials or whatever it is, uh, or sometimes ascended master's visit, or for me, Miss Master Ka, right? Like th these things happen. So, so even my experience of it is a very specific sort of experience of it. Um, uh, that isn't quite explained by what I just said. So, so, um, so there is like, there is a capacity in the being to call sort of for help from its collective. If it's an older soul that has a lot of ties, a lot of associations and things, um, it may call for some aid from its collective and then can have aid be given if the soul itself is in harmony with that aid. Like the soul may not w agree with the human's desire for aid, right? That's part of the battle that's happening. The battle of the beast is what it really is. Um, this is why your Saturn return is like Satan's return, right? It's the beast starts to fight against the soul or the soul is trying to get the, the that's the better way to look at it is the soul is trying to get the beast into alignment with itself around the age of 30. Um, and then, uh, you know, it happens again when we have this, the Saturn return again. But um, generally speaking, where it's a, it, we, we want to like recognize and embrace every aspect of the human. This is what the holy matrimony is about, is about understanding the human at a mastery level, like understanding our own mind basically is the first step of this. And then we start to really understand the body too. But the first step is to really understand the mind. Why am I thinking how I'm thinking? And also, uh, Dis dissolving the need to think about it as well. Like dissolving the need to follow the mind, knowing that the heart and soul pulling is where the true bounties are, where the treasures hid, so to speak. Um, so you don't need to think your way through things. You just have to listen to the soul or ask God for guidance, of course, right? Ask God to direct the soul, like, you know, show me the way, right? And um, usually if you do that and you, uh, if you're earnest and honest about, and authentic and you're wanting to be shown the way, like you're approaching it from that, I don't, I don't know mind. 
I couldn't know, so I'm going to go to the knower of all. You know, what's the best way for me to be of proper service here, right? The more we do that, the more thinking doesn't really even occur to us that much. You know, we're, we're not so much deciding things. We're just, we're just leaving it like, hey, we can hear, we can feel what we're doing a little bit better. And so d d we're at different stages of that. Uh, we might not really do that at all. And uh, I, I'm just saying that the stress that an analysis, the energy we use as well <laughs> in our analytical minds is huge. Um, and there's not, there isn't that much to think about. You know, not really that much to truly think about of value. Um, even even when you're doing things, right? Uh, if there are things you know how to do, you're not really thinking that much about it. We, you really you want to use, use the mind to learn, to think about things and consider what's curious and what's interesting and what's expanding. And you can use the mind that way as like a little tool to just gather interesting bits of information about things. But beyond that, it's not really, um, it's not really a good place to, uh, to dwell in too much. And I say that, and I'm sort of obsessed with thinking. I can't help it. Um, so I think that's why this is so clear to me is because it, for me, thinking is so addictive. And so I, I just had to notice my patterning of thinking. So uh, and, uh, in my own thinking, just noticing that I used to have a tendency to have negative thoughts quite a lot, like just constantly affirming for myself negative things. <clears throat> and so when we get the mind under more of a mastery state, uh, I wouldn't say I've mastered it, but I'm getting quite good. Um, the we start to be able to notice that those thoughts like they don't really resonate as anything to worth be wor worried about and we just we don't for, we don't beat ourselves up or shame ourselves it's just a thought thing like it's gone right so we are at that place and then i don't get that many um not too too many negative thoughts just occurring to me like that anymore because the we're just not resonant with that frequency really and we we keep showing the universe we're not resonant with the frequency we're like teaching the universe. No, 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 I don't really receive that. I don't really receive that stuff. Um, and it doesn't mean things aren't happening around us that aren't necessarily great, right? Like things can happen around us that uh, are quite not great. Um, <laughs> but the thoughts are still just like, oh, I wonder what this is about. I wonder what I'm going to learn about here. Oh, this is different i didn't expect this that's more of the thoughts um not as much resistance to life when we're sitting in the soul because the soul the soul is more trusting in that it knows that it's it's okay um like the light we are is more trusting in that knows we're okay it's it, but there's this naivete aspect that we like to that we should look at as well of you know we'll end up over trusting people because we see just how awesome they are and then we just trust them in a way that probably wasn't a good idea because uh you know but but at the same time we want to be trusting right we want to be trusting people uh it's much better to trust someone in my experience i would say it's much better to trust someone um you know, if we have a good feeling about it, then it is to just presume somebody's going to wrong us or something or betray. It's much better to live a world in a world of trust and faith in all things. Um, you know, but we we don't really have to worry too much about trust when we just leave it to God, right? So if if we trust that they'll be this way or that way, and then they're not that way, then you know, we're going to feel ouch about that. It's going to hurt. Instead, we just, they say they seem to be this way. We just leave it to God. They'll be the way they are. Like, it's, I shouldn't really get wrapped up in opinions about it if I, if I can help it because 
they're going to they're going to be different all the time really um who could know how they'll be day to day right um who could know if they'll actually stay in your life who could know you know um something in in stoicism that really helps is uh, memento mori which is just remember that you die um and all it really is meant to say is that life here in the material like everything has a time to expire and that includes like relationships and all these other things um and if we just stop being really invested in these things uh we feel better because we we actually we think basically because of how we've born been born and experienced things we think that investing in the relationships itself is what will help us find what we're looking for when it that's not the case what we're looking for is already within us and so when we feel whole within us that's when we're in a good spot to be healthy in a healthy relationship if we don't feel whole within us then um we're going to keep trying to get ourselves from other people uh whether it's our children or our parents or our you know and we do it in so many different ways you know something i used to do a lot was try to get my parents to say like positive things about something i'm doing so i'd like tell them i did a cool thing to see what they'd say and i don't think they were picking up what i was doing like what i was looking for or just weren't it was important for me to to just not receive any feedback at the time um and it, i i knew they weren't i didn't take hold anything against them but like i it made me want that feedback more and more and more right until it became this clear sort of uh oh i'm like sort of obsessed with their whether or not they give me a f good feedback i'm kind of obsessed with it a little bit right and so i was able to notice that and let go of that um, this is a few years ago, so I don't really do that stuff anymore. But it's a good example of just getting wrapped up in something in a, like even just a, a small detail like that. That's not anything to do with the relationships or whatever. That's literally just a behavior I had that was drawn from this, someone please tell me I'm doing a good job. Sort of, I need people to tell me, right? Um, I I need someone to appreciate me properly. For a minute um sort of that's what's driving that that desperation and and lots of people when there's a desperation energy uh, they don't really realize it but instinctually they they won't give the thing they won't they they a lot of people just won't say the thing they won't do the thing because the desperation energy is one of the frequencies of consciousness that is super uh unsettling it's an unsettling frequency to sort of depending on the person's sensitivity uh receiving really desperate desperate type of energy feels a bit blah so if they're not super conscious or super super awake they will tend to just sort of ignore it not really just sort of ignore it like they don't even listen to it they're just like whatever Pfft. i don't know exactly their experience of it but they tend to just not really hear it or think anything of it. Um, it's like discarded. But if we're more sensitive, then we will usually feel a bit like this seems weird. Like it doesn't seem great for for some reason. We, we may not be able to quite put our finger on it. But what's happening is we're noticing that um, like someone is is sort of over attached somewhere to something and they're being desperate and it reminds us of our own desperation. Um, and we don't resonate anymore really with desperation for things. Um, or or we're uncomfortable that we are desperate for things, right? So it's a bit of both. Like, if it bothers us that that someone seems desperate, then it's probably a good thing to look at because what we're saying essentially is that when I see desperation, it's upsetting me. 
So, but if we can see it and we just like, it doesn't resonate, that's a different thing, right? It's, it's, it's not resonating is not an emotional response. That's like, this is just not really a thing for me to worry about. It's not really a thing. I'm not really experiencing this. Uh, I'm not going to experience this or I'm going to just not really participate in this thing. It's not emotional or really opinionated beyond that. Once we start to add an opinion to it, then we've invested into it as something meaningful, which means it does resonate. Despite us maybe saying that doesn't resonate because I don't like, or I'm a vegetarian or vegan, so I can't go into McDonald's. I'm not, I'm not like, it just doesn't resonate. I can't be inside of it or something. I'm not trying to make fun of anyone, but that means that you have a, a wound there around this, right? That's a wound. I, I can't be in this building. Um, you know, it just means there's a wound and that's okay. Um, but I guess we're just talking about sort of the difference between resonance and, and opinion. And there's a pretty big different difference. Like something just doesn't resonate with the soul. Usually older souls are not going to resonate with desperation type energy too much. Um, unless they've been really wounded, right? And become quite desperate themselves as well. Uh, but even then, when they, 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 we, tend to, we tend to try to hide our desperation even to ourselves. So um, we don't really notice the seeking outside behaviors too much until we do. And then it can be quite, oh, my God, like, I'm an animal. <laughs> right? Everything I do, I'm like reaching for this, reaching for that. Oh, now I need this. Now I need this video. Now I need to text someone. Oh, my gosh. What am I doing? <laughs> right <laughs> it starts to become like you know we're not supposed to be in in too involved in the illusion but i'm so involved <laughs> right it's quite it's quite fun quite funny so all i recommend is laughing at ourselves a bit and and noticing that stuff it doesn't have to be a bad we're so hard on ourselves already like we don't have to add to it we're already stubbing our toes and like crashing our cars sometimes and like, you know, weird stuff happening or like crazy weather blowing up the coastal regions of our country. You know, there's stuff happening already. We don't need to add to it with our own like shaming and guilting ourselves. We just don't have to do that at all. Um, recognize where we're making some errors, but in, in just how we're showing up, but not in a way of like slapping ourselves, like we were taught basically. Most humans were sort of taught like, if you do something wrong, you have to be disciplined. But you know, Jesus, I think teaches it best, repentant, just repent, which it means you try to um, offer restitution in some way. You try to do something to resolve it, to offer something, and you, uh, you offer your apology as well. Uh, and you do that first with God, right? You know, Father, forgive me. I, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, basically, I, I recommend it. I heard, I think I heard um, Michael Murdad say this, but you're pleading, you sort of plead insanity. You're like, I was kind of insane then. That's why I did that thing. And um, I see now, I truly see what that insanity was. And like, I, I've investigated what, created that that was that's for me that's my the way i do restitution for myself the way i feel better for myself is making sure i get the as much as i can out of that lesson like those are the hardest ones because you have to take responsibility for the thing you did like the specific thing and just how ignorant you might have been at the time um and, and when I say ignorant, and you know, these words, people don't like them. Like when I say insanity or ignorant, um, it sounds derogatory. I think that's just because of the stigma associated with these things. It's coming from a place of just understanding that we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know. Because if we did know, we would have done the thing better, right? We would have done a better thing. Otherwise, we wouldn't be even thinking about this thing. It would just be a nothing that, that happened. 
uh, you know, our lessons are contained in the places that got, we get emotionally swayed in. Not where others necessarily get emotionally swayed in. That's their lessons. Where we are emotionally swayed is our lesson. That's the like meat and potatoes for us. So if we know that we didn't do anything hurtful, uh, we weren't thinking hurtful things, we weren't intending hurtful things, and we and someone else is emotionally disturbed by us, then we can immediately just be like, well, they must be having a lesson. Maybe my lesson is just to see how I can hold space for this and respond to this kindly. Because sometimes, you know, a lot of times, we're sort of getting... Um, projected at that point so people start to project things when they get emotional from something that isn't meant to be anything and uh you know this this is part of our soul understanding how it whether or not it, it's holding value in that exchange like it's not actually about us really they they may think it is but they're having an emotional thing with themselves, within themselves, observing us and what we've done or not done uh, with our pure intentions, but not being able to see our intentions. Not all of that's veiled, right? So they don't know what's going on and what I've done, what you've seemed to have done has bothered them, of course, right? And uh, for you, if you know that you didn't do anything wrong, then it just becomes a question of, do I have enough in my tank of peace to just say, I didn't realize that you saw it that way. Uh, th thank you for letting me know. Um, I, I apologize for that. I apologize for, for that experience that you're having about, about this, something like that. You're not like, you're not investing yourself in saying that, yeah, I, I totally did that. I'm, you know, you're also not getting defensive. Like, I, how dare you? I never, we don't want to really go to any extremes. Um, you know, of course, every, every situation is different. Um, and we have our limits, you know, uh, never am I recommending we just listen to someone try to emotionally abuse us or something. Uh, but it becomes important that we notice where we're, um, where we're tying ourselves up in whether or not they're upset with us. Like, if they're upset with us and we didn't do anything hurtful and we can offer our, you know, apology for that, a sincere, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that that was your experience. And, and if, if there's opening, we can bridge with our intentions and say, my intentions were just to be this way, do this. Like, I didn't mean this. Hopefully that's enough, right? If that's not enough, then, I mean, uh, you know, you can try again, but I don't know what else really you can say too much. You know, if, if that's not enough, then, uh, you know, it's not really our job to tell them, oh, you need to look at yourself. Oh, this is about yourself. And, you know, maybe, maybe we do that. I've certainly done that before, and I, I don't really recommend it because it's not, not usually helpful. They're already in that moment. They're, they're believing it was you. So <laughs> they're believing you did something to them. Uh, so if they're in that space, then they're not really going to hear that properly, most likely. Unless you're super, super good at compassionately bridging. So, but we're not, we shouldn't all need to be therapists with everyone, right? <laughs> you know, there, we should be able to just be ourselves and like, people should just pretty much be okay with that and if there's people that just have a big problem with who you are um, maybe we don't need to really engage with them too much anymore they seem to just have a problem with who we are so that's okay right um usually this is just indicators to us that you know the question though becomes like do we have a problem with them though as well is the, all of this a problem with them because if we're upset with them, then there's still stuff to look at as well. There's still forgiveness to be had. There's still things to be looking at for sure. 
uh, if we're running away from someone because we're so scared of them and what they might, you know, then we need to sort of let go of that too. We don't want to run away from people and hold on to the pain too much, right? Although we tend to. So if, if we're doing that, that's okay. It's just about noticing. It's always just about noticing, trying to smile at it, trying to make it fun, trying to look at things through the lens of these mythos, these really interesting stories. I really enjoy tying them all together. Um, and I really like when spirits just sort of drops this little vision of like, oh, wow, wow. And I, I start to notice these metaphysical concepts of the soul graduating into third density and what it's like for the brand new soul coming in. Um, it's, it's all just very, very interesting. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I wasn't able to go live today because there was, uh, yeah, the stream just wasn't working. So we'll do it this way. And um, I hope you found that interesting. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And, um, you know, we kind of we went all over the place today. But uh, hopefully, hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully you have a beautiful day. Take care.